Um, welcome to you all. Our talk today is Common Native Ferns of the Mid-Atlantic. I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Elaine Mills, who I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with because Elaine is kind of our native plants maven. She's been a master gardener since 2012. She's also been growing native plants in her own home garden since 2010 and also has helped grow them at the Glen Carlin Demonstration Garden, of which she is one of the coordinators. Elaine is also responsible for this wonderful feature on our website called Tried and True Native Plants, which some of you may have run across. And the other neat thing is that a lot of the pictures in these presentations are ones that Elaine has taken herself. Thank you very much, Colleen. Uh, welcome everyone to another of our talks in Sustainable Landscaping series. Welcome everyone and let's begin. I'll begin today by giving you just a brief background information and then go on to discuss the unique life cycle of ferns. I'll also describe their distinct physical characteristics and there'll be a lot of new glossary terms that you may not be familiar with. So I'll bring those up and explain those. I'll also mention some excellent reasons for you to consider growing ferns in your own gardens. And then I'll be moving on to discuss some commonly grown ferns for the Mid-Atlantic region. I'll describe the distinguishing features, growth habits and preferences for sun exposure and moisture. And I'll also be mentioning along the way, the various ways in which these plants can provide support for wildlife and how you might use them in the landscape. And then at the end, I'll talk about how you can care for the ferns, where to see them, and where to buy them. Ferns, along with horsetails and club mosses, are some of the oldest members of the plant kingdom, and we actually see fossil evidence of them predating the arrival of the dinosaurs. The oldest still living fern is interrupted fern that dates back 220 million years. And today's current oil reserves actually originated from decayed ferns and vegetation going back to the Carboniferous period. There are 11,000 species of ferns worldwide, 100 of them native to the East Coast. And when I took a look at the flora of Virginia, I found that there are over 60 of them native to our state. Some of them are native to the entire region, others just to limited parts of the state, and some maybe to just a single county or two. Some of them have very intriguing names, rattlesnake fern, bulblet bladder fern, hairy lip fern. Unfortunately, we won't have time to discuss all of them today. I'm going to zero in on 16 of the commonly grown ferns native to the Mid-Atlantic. These are going to be ferns that I've either grown myself in my own garden or the Glen Carlin demonstration garden, ferns grown in other demonstration gardens in our master gardener unit, and especially those that are going to be commonly available to you in the horticulture trade. Let's begin by talking about the unique life cycle of ferns. These are herbaceous, non-woody plants, but they're different from many of the others in that they are not flowering. So the fern life cycle has two distinct stages. In the first one, mature fern plants will produce spores. Those are microscopic structures that contain genetic material that can allow a new fern to form. And these are released into the wind. If these find a favorable location, they will germinate into small heart-shaped plants. These are fairly inconspicuous, maybe only about the size of a fingernail, and they in turn will go on to produce male and female cells. These require water, either from rain or dew, to allow the male sperm to move to the female eggs, and when they meet, they will fertilize and allow the development of a whole new adult fern. Ferns have very interesting structures, and I'll be referring to a lot of the terminology. You'll be able to see this on the second page of your handout. 
Ferns grow from rhizomes, which are underground stems, and these allow the plants both to be stabilized and to store nutrients that will fuel their growth in the spring. Erect rhizomes are packed tightly together into a crown in what are referred to as the clumping ferns. And other types of ferns will grow laterally, either along the surface or just under the ground. And these are referred to as spreading ferns. There are several categories of these. Those that grow more slowly may spread by only an inch or two at a time, and others could grow as much as a foot a year. Now, the emerging shoots of ferns are tightly coiled and they're referred to either as fiddleheads, similar to the top of our stringed instruments like a violin, or croziers, like the curving part of a shepherd's crook. These will roll out from the base to the tip and the base will grow faster before that tip finally unfurls. And interestingly, these are completely formed leaves. They're covered by chaff-like scales. These are referred to as ramenta. The singular form of the word is ramentum. And these provide protection both against drought or any injury. The uh, fronds of the ferns are the leaves of the fern plant, and they're divided into several parts. The leaf stalk or the stem is referred to as the stipe. The lamina or blade is the leafy area of the frond. And it has a central, a mid rib or vein referred to as the rachis. And finally, the fern frond is divided into pinnae or leaflets. And the singular form of that word is pinna. Fronds have two functions. They're involved, of course, as all plants in photosynthesis, but they also fill a reproductive function. Fronds can be divided into several types based on the way in which they're divided. They can either be lobed or divided into separate segments. A sensitive fern and netted chain fern are two examples of what are called pinnatifid ferns. These are the ones that are divided into lobes and the lobes remain connected to that central vein, the rachis. Then other ferns, such as Christmas fern, marginal wood fern, and ostrich fern are referred to as pinnate. These will have very distinct pinnae. You can see them joined here along the rachis. These particular ones happen to be alternate, and some will be attached in an opposite fashion. All of these pinnae are attached to that rachis, that central stem. And some of them can be divided even further into what are referred to as pinules. Frond types uh, can also be distinguished by spore production. Now, ferns have two types of fronds, either sterile fronds, which are the vegetative growing fronds, or fertile fronds, which will have the reproductive parts. In some ferns, like marginal wood fern, these two types of fronds will appear virtually the same. The distinction will be that the undersides of the fertile fronds will have what are referred to as sori. These are clusters of sporangia, which are the spore producing receptacles. They come in different shapes and different arrangements. And uh, quite often looking at the sori, you'll be able to distinguish between a genus or even a species of fern. Other types of ferns will have a single frond that's divided into distinct sterile or fertile parts. An example here is Christmas fern, where you'll see the fertile upper pinnae, the sterile parts will be beneath. In interrupted fern, the fertile pinnae are these brown ones here, and they are interspersed along that stem. And in royal fern, you will actually see fertile tassels of the sporangia that are held above the, the sterile pinnae. And finally, there can be ferns where there are entire fertile fronds that are developed and they will have a completely different appearance from the sterile fronds. With ostrich fern, there'll be these very erect, almost feathery, dark green fertile fronds. 
in cinnamon fern, these wand-like fertile fronds that uh, will turn this deep cinnamon color as they mature. Another example is sensitive fern, where you'll see these shorter fertile structures. They begin green and then they'll turn brown as they mature. There are many reasons to grow ferns. Of course, they're not flowering, but they do provide year-round interest in the garden. The fiddleheads will offer early signs of life in the spring. The foliage uh, provides many interesting textures and a cool calming presence in the heat of the summer. Uh, some species will actually turn a spectacular colors in the fall. And then some species are evergreen or have interesting lingering fertile fronds that will provide winter interest. You'll have a wide range of choices of plants from those that are suitable for dry or wet locations. So you're sure to find some that will fit in your particular garden. Most of them will grow in part to full shade. This is wonderful for those of you who are looking for excellent plants for a shade garden, but a few of them can actually grow in sun provided with sufficient moisture. And ferns can provide a various landscape of roles. They can be accent plants, edging plants, or even ground covers. And very interestingly, ferns are deer and rabbit resistant and generally free of pests and diseases. Let's begin taking a look at the common ferns of the Mid-Atlantic. You'll be able to follow along on the first page of the handout, the ferns that I'll be describing. I've provided both the common names and the scientific names. And on the handout, you'll see that there are active links. These will take you to the fact sheets on our Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia website that Colleen mentioned. I'll be discussing initially 11 ferns that are grown in our Master Gardener demonstration gardens, and then an additional five that have been flagged by our local Plant Nova Natives initiative that are suitable for the Northern Virginia region. Now, as I've mentioned, all ferns grow from rhizomes, but they grow in slightly different ways. There are the clumping ferns, ebony, spleenwort, marginal wood fern, and Christmas fern. Then there are slow spreading ferns, maidenhair, interrupted, cinnamon, and royal fern. And finally, I'll discuss the fast spreading ferns, hay scented, ostrich, lady, and sensitive fern. So we'll begin with the clumping ferns. Ebony spleenwort, Esplinium platyneuron, grows in dry forested areas, especially in rocky woodlands and outcrops. It grows throughout the eastern United States and even west to Missouri, Arkansas, and Louisiana. This is an evergreen fern that will form small loose clusters. It's fairly small, 6 to 18 inches in height, grows in part to full shade, this can uh, grow in dry to moist soil in a range of soil types, although it does prefer acidic pH conditions. This is tolerant of heavy shade, and it's uh, one of the most drought tolerant of the native ferns. It begins with these glossy green leaflets on green stems, and they will begin unfurling in April. They have what are referred to as dimorphic fronds, two different types. There'll be evergreen sterile fronds in the basal rosette, and these are only maybe two to six inches in length, and they're a lighter green color. Then the erect fertile fronds are deciduous, and they can be up to 20 inches long, and you'll see that they have these alternating pinnae that range from this middle size down to a very narrow tip. It's referred to as ebony spleenwort because of the deep purple-brown, almost black stipe, that's the stem, and rachis, that mid-vein of the fronds. They have spleen-shaped sori that are arranged in a chevron pattern on the underside of the leaflets. And these spores will be released in summer to early fall. Interestingly, ebony spleenwort can also reproduce vegetatively from buds. These are button-like forms that are attached to the base of the fern, and they will be spurred into growth either when they touch soil or when leaf litter covers them. 
Ebony spleenwort grows in crevices, even on bare rock or in very thin soil. So it's suitable for woodland gardens, gravel or rock gardens, or can even grow out of brick walls. And you can use it as a very light and airy cover in dry areas that most ferns can't handle. Our next clumping fern is marginal wood fern, Dryopteris marginalis. Dryopteris is a fairly large genus. I'll be talking about two other ferns in this genus shortly. You may be familiar with another fern, a non-native fern in this genus, Dryopteris erythrosora, which is autumn or Japanese shield fern, which is native to East Asia. This particular native fern grows in woodlands, rocky slopes, and ledges from Maine to Pennsylvania. And then from New Jersey south, you'll primarily see it in the mountains and the inner Piedmont region. This is another evergreen fern. It has a vase-shaped clump with upright arching fronds. This is taller than the ebony spleenwort, about one to three feet tall and 18 inches to 24 inches wide. This can provide really nice cover for ground nesting birds, toads, and lizards. Again, grows in part to full shade and dry to moist soil. This one also tolerates dense shade. And in my garden, I found that it's quite drought tolerant once established. Uh, you'll want to protect it from wind because of the delicate divisions of the fronds. It begins its growth with this dense covering I've referred to before, the ramenta, those chaffy coverings over the young fronds. Then the fiddleheads will have kind of a golden brown furry look with the remnants of the ramenta, and you'll see those in early April. The marginal wood fern has tapering what are referred to as twice pinnate fronds with these very delicate pinules. They can range from 15 to 20 inches long and as much as 10 inches wide. With marginal wood fern, you'll see the sori on the undersides of the fronds, and they're arranged in these neat rows at the edges, hence the term marginal wood fern. You'll see these from June to October when they release their spores. The sori will change appearance over time. They have almost a silvery blue look. Then they'll turn gray and then finally mature to brown before they release the spores. Marginal wood fern is a very well-behaved fern and very attractive to combine with other shade-loving plants in a woodland garden. Now, as I've mentioned, these clumping ferns aren't going to spread in a colony, but they will enlarge in size at the base over time. But if you wanted to use them to stabilize a dry shaded slope, you could plant them en masse. In other words, plant multiples of those. Marginal wood fern, because it is evergreen, can help a cover fading foliage of spring ephemerals. And it's also very attractive combined with woodland asters like white wood aster or the blue wood aster and golden rods in the fall. And our final clumping fern is Christmas fern, Polystichum acrosticoides. This is native to moist and dry forests all the way from Maine to Georgia and even west to eastern Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, and another evergreen fern. This one grows in circular cascading clumps, and it can range from six inches to about two feet tall. Another one that's great for providing cover for ground nesting birds, and they will actually use some of the plant parts in nest construction. It grows in part to full shade, dry to moist rich soil. Another one that tolerates dense shade and drought. And this one particularly dislikes clay soil and standing water. I understand that it's sometimes beneficial to actually plant the rhizomes on a slight angle that will allow any moisture to run off so that they won't rot out with an overabundance of water around the roots in the winter time. And as I've mentioned, these clumping ferns will increase in size over time. So interestingly, all three of our clumping ferns are evergreen, and all three of them are drought tolerant. Christmas fern grows from crownless rootstock, and you'll again see the ramenta protecting the fronds. These have silvery scaled fiddleheads from late March to April. 
the mature fronds are glossy and very leathery. And you'll see the pinnae have slightly toothed edges. They're called Christmas ferns because of this lobe that is very evident at the base. They are said to look something like Christmas stockings. And they're also called Christmas fern because of their evergreen nature. With Christmas fern, as I've mentioned earlier, you'll see the tall, fertile fronds at the center of the clumps with the sore developing on the undersides at the top of those fronds. Christmas fern can be used as an accent plant or can be grouped under trees in a woodland. You can plant it en masse to control erosion. Now let's move on to the slow spreading ferns. The first is maidenhair fern, Adiantum pedatum. This grows throughout much of the eastern United States, mostly in the mountains and Piedmont region from Maryland south in moist woods. It's clump forming, but will slowly spread with its lateral rhizomes. It ranges from 12 to 30 inches tall, so it can provide some shelter for small animals. It grows in part to full shade and tolerates dense shade. It uh, prefers moist soil, and it's uh, said to grow in calcium soil, especially in rocky areas. This particular fern prefers to be kept evenly moist, and it will tend to turn brown if it's suffering from intense heat, sun, or dry soil in the summertime. Its growth begins with these pinkish brown fiddleheads in April, and it has a very unusual structure. Unlike any of the other ferns, the frond blades are held horizontally in a fan-like shape. The rachis, that central stem, is divided into two branches that look like semicircles. The fern actually grows with a dark stem, and when viewed from the side, it looks almost like small trees with the horizontal fronds being held almost as though they're suspended in midair. The fronds are divided into very delicate frilly pinules, and as you can see, these are somewhat water resistant, and they're on a shiny, wiry, dark black stalks. The sore are very different in appearance from those we've discussed earlier. These are located just on that upper outer edge of the leaflets, and you'll see them from July to September. This, uh, because it's somewhat shorter, is an excellent fern to use as edging, kind of a green mulch under shrubs. Very attractive also along pathways. And because of its interesting texture, it's lovely to combine with other shade-loving perennials. Our next slow spreading fern is interrupted fern. When we've described it on our website, we've used the scientific name Osmunda claytoniana. The species name is reference to the early Virginia botanist, John Clayton. But when I took a closer look at our flora of Virginia, I see that it is now going by the designation Claytosmunda claytoniana. So you may see it uh, with both names. Most of the other scientific sites that I'm referring to list it as Osmunda claytoniana. This is a native to moist woods, slopes, and swamp edges. You'll see it all the way on the East Coast from Maine to North Carolina. It's mostly in the mountains and the Piedmont, and it's scattered further west. This is another fern that grows in vase-shaped clumps, and it has very heavy rhizomes, and these are sometimes harvested for what's referred to as osmunda fiber. This is a perfect growing medium for orchids. The fern grows two to three feet high and wide, another one that's going to provide great cover for birds and other animals. Grows in part to full shade in moist, rich soil and another one that tolerates dense shade and even dry or rocky soil. And this one can reach as tall as five to six feet, provided with constant moisture. Interrupted fern has fiddleheads with silvery white hairs, and the sterile fronds will encircle the taller fertile fronds. The pinnae 
of those uh, sterile fronds are lime to medium green with compound foliage on smooth green stalks. The fertile fronds have two to five pairs of spore bearing pinnae. They're located in the middle of the blade. They begin green and then they'll mature to brown from May to June. And then those will release their spores and drop off. This is a great fern to use in woodland gardens or a shady mixed border. Our next slowly spreading fern is cinnamon fern, Osmondrostrum cinnamomayum. This again is native to the eastern US all the way to Oklahoma and eastern Texas, native to very moist locations, swamps, bogs, and floodplain forests. Another one with a vase-shaped clump, and this one also has the matted wiry roots that can be harvested as osmunda fiber. This one grows two to three feet high and wide. This colony uh, can provide protective cover. And this one prefers moist to wet conditions, especially humus-rich soil, can tolerate dense shade, can also, on the other end of the spectrum, tolerate full sun if it's located in standing water. This one has very distinctive fiddle heads covered with very woolly hairs, and this soft fuzz is actually collected by birds as nest lining material. It has erect fertile fronds. They're actually going to be the fronds that will emerge first. And they will develop into these thick spikes of sporangia, which turn the characteristic cinnamon brown as they mature. Then the sterile fronds will develop and they arch outward surrounding those central fertile fronds. And this is the fern that takes on a spectacular vibrant fall foliage color. Cinnamon fern is quite a dramatic accent plant in woodlands and mixed borders. And its fibrous roots, the ones I've mentioned, are fabulous for holding soil in place in rain gardens or on pond edges. Our final slowly spreading fern is royal fern, now referred to as Osmundo spectabilis. You may sometimes see it going by its earlier name, Osmunda regalis. Another fern native to the entire eastern United States, west to Oklahoma and eastern Texas. And this one is in shaded forests and other wet locations such as marshes and floodplains. This one grows in tall, erect clumps, anywhere from two to six feet tall and not quite as wide, two to three feet wide. Again, growing in part to full shade, and this one prefers moist to wet soil. It tolerates dense shade, drought, on the other hand, brief flooding, and can grow as shown here in sun with sufficient moisture, provides some nice cover for wildlife. This one has very woolly hair covered fiddleheads and probably the most colorful of the fiddleheads, they are this orangey pink in color. And then as they unfurl, they will turn that light spring green. The leaflets on the sterile fronds are rounded and very widely separated. And as I mentioned earlier, the fertile leaflets are densely covered with bead-like sporangia. They're held in these tassel-like structures above the sterile leaflets. They'll mature from this lime green to brown. And royal fern, because of its height, is quite a striking accent plant, ideal for use in woodland, rain, or water gardens. And finally, we'll take a look at some fast spreading ferns. The first of these is hay scented fern, Denstedia punctilobula. This grows from Maine to Pennsylvania, and then from Maryland south, it's primarily found in the mountain and Piedmont regions, native to open woods and dry slopes. This one, interestingly, is an aromatic fern. It has the scent of new mown hay, either when the fresh fronds are crushed or when they are dried. This is very erect and it will spread in patches. The individual fronds are about one to three feet tall. So another fern that can provide cover for wildlife. 
This one again grows in part to full shade and can tolerate more dry soil. In addition, dense shade, even salt spray and sun with sufficient moisture. This one may decline somewhat in late summer if it is too dry. This one, again, has very different fiddleheads. These are hairy, pubescent. They will emerge in mid-April. And you'll continue to see a fine hairs on the stems and the underside of the fronds. These fronds are very finely divided. They're lacy and yellow-green in color with a very pointed tip. They have cup-like sori on the underside. This is sometimes referred to as cup fern. You can use hay scented fern as we do in our shady demonstration garden when combined with woodland wildflowers. But because it can spread quite aggressively to form colonies, it may best be used as a ground cover in larger woodland areas. The next fast spreading fern is lady fern, sometimes referred to as southern lady fern, Ethereum asplenioides. This one was formerly identified as Ethereum felix femina. Another fern in the Ethereum genus that some of you may be familiar with is Ethereum nipponicum pictum. This is the very popular Japanese painted fern. This fern is native to woodland ravines, moist woods, and floodplains all the way from New York to Georgia and west as far as eastern Texas. This grows in dense world clumps, about one to three feet tall. Again, part to full shade is its preference. This one is going to grow in moist to wet, rich soil, and it will need shelter from the wind. It unfurls with a very distinctly reddish rachis in April, and you'll continue to see that red color going down the center of the fern as the fronds mature. They're very feathery and arching with widely spaced pinnae. And you'll see the sori on the underside of those fronds. This one spreads by lateral rhizomes, sometimes aggressively. So it would be ideal for planting on large scale woodlands along streams or pond edges to help prevent erosion. Our next uh, quickly spreading fern is ostrich fern, Batuchia struthiopterus. This grows in the northeastern quadrant of the United States and only four counties in Virginia, Arlington and Fairfax County being two of them. This one is native to swamps, thickets, and the understory of woodlands, and forms very large vase-shaped clumps, three to six feet in height, and by far the widest spreading of our ferns, anywhere from five to eight feet in spread, so provides very protective cover for wildlife. This one will grow in part to full shade and moist to wet, humus-rich soil. This tolerates dense shade and even clay soil and sun to some extent with sufficient moisture. You'll see the green fiddle heads of ostrich fern emerging in March. And I'd like to point out that these are the only edible fiddle heads. In the past, the fiddleheads of other native ferns were considered to be edible, but they've now been determined to contain carcinogenic compounds. So these are the ones that you will see offered as a special delicacy in restaurants. Should you want to find out how to collect and prepare them for yourselves, you can follow the link for the glossary term fiddlehead on the second page of your handout, and you'll see links from our website to some sources that will tell you exactly how to go about collecting and preparing those. Ostrich fern has finely dissected sterile fronds and they will unfurl to about four feet in length. And as I mentioned earlier, this is one of the ferns that has distinctive fertile fronds. These are very erect, 18 inches tall and dark green. These will develop in midsummer but they will not actually mature until somewhat later. They will turn brown and be held in the center even when the sterile fronds have faded away over the winter, and they will not release their spores until the following spring. 
This is quite a dramatic accent plant to use in large woodland gardens. And as I've said, it can spread vigorously to form large colonies. So you could allow it to spread as a ground cover in wet areas of your garden. The last of the fast spreading ferns is sensitive fern, Onoclea sensibilis, another one native to wet woods, thickets, also found along streams and springs in the eastern United States, all the way west to the Mississippi River and even in scattered areas beyond that. This fern grows with a kind of a sprawling or creeping habit, the individual fronds reaching from one to four feet tall. And this is another one that can provide shelter for small animals. This one prefers moist to wet, rich soil and is probably the most sensitive of all of the ferns. It's going to be sensitive, first of all, to drought in the summer. It will fade at the first sign of fall frost. It also needs constant moisture and protection from wind as well. This one has pale reddish fiddleheads, and they will unfurl in this interesting way with the two sides of the pinnae peeling away from that central rachis. And those sterile fronds have short white hairs. This has a deeply cut opposite leaflets. So this is one of the lobed ferns and the edges of those pinnae have wavy margins and it has this wide winged midrib. Now, there are different theories as to why some of these lobed ferns have that wide midrib along the rachis. There's some thinking that this may provide a little bit more protection for the fronds, the finely divided fronds, with wind. Perhaps this could allow the fern to shed water maybe along the rachis to the tip. And there's been some conjecture that perhaps it could provide an extra leaf surface for photosynthesis. Sensitive fern has shorter fertile fronds. They're a little difficult to see here. I've enlarged them here. They're green and they have bead-like sporangia leading to the alternative common name bead fern. These mature uh, to brown in the fall and uh, like those of the ostrich fern, they will linger through the winter and the spores will be released in the spring. Sensitive fern uh, is great for use in moist shaded gardens. You could also naturalize it along streams and ponds or in rain gardens. It can spread quite aggressively in optimum conditions. Uh, do we have any questions now, Colleen? Someone from Charlottesville uh, has noticed volunteer ferns in their garden and wondered if that would more likely be maidenhair or the ebony leanwort ferns. You know, uh, I guess I guess it's really hard to say, uh, maybe depending on the moisture condition in your garden, you could determine whether it would be more likely to be one or another. I okay. understand from speaking with a fellow master gardener that the non native autumn fern can spread quite easily. So if a neighboring garden perhaps has that fern, that might be the one that, that could be spreading. But all of them spread by airborne ferns. So if there are ferns nearby, it really could be any of them that are growing in that area. Okay, great. I know you had mentioned either to us or in general that ferns are pretty good for deer and rabbits, but are there ones in particular you would recommend for deer resistance? Or are they all good? There is no plant that is completely safe from deer. If they yeah. are starving, they will look for various kinds of vegetation. But ferns, by and large, as a whole category, are said to be rabbit and deer resistant. There was a question about whether the hay-scented fern will compete well with invasives. I understand that because it's quite aggressive, could handle competition with those other categories of plants. How mature does a fern have to be to have sori? Ah, oh, that's a good question. I understand as long as it's developing into its full mature size, that it would be reproducing at that point. 
All right, I'd like to speak briefly about some additional ferns that are native to Northern Virginia. These have been flagged by our Plant Nova Natives Initiative as suitable for this region. We don't tend to grow these in our demonstration garden. I don't have as much information about them and they are not all as readily available in the horticulture trade, but I will give you some brief discussion on these. The first of these is another in that Dryopteris genus, evergreen wood fern. This is the same genus as the marginal wood fern. This one appears in Northern Virginia, frequently in the mountains and infrequently elsewhere. This one can be found in cool sheltered habitats outside of the mountain region. This one, like marginal wood fern, is a clumping fern, and you'll see it in a vase-like cluster. This one is shorter, only about 10 inches tall. This one likes full shade and moist soil. It has evergreen, lacy fronds, and there's extreme variability in this size and the color. Another of the uh, Dryopteris ferns is Spinulose wood fern, Dryopteris carthusiniana, found in Northern Virginia, also in Virginia, it's mainly in the mountains and infrequently elsewhere. This one prefers much of moisture conditions native to wet woods, swamps, and bogs. Again, has a clumping vase-like shape. This one's a little taller than the previous one, 18 to 36 inches tall the typical shade preferences. And this one has finely divided lacy fronds and the sterile fronds will be evergreen. So two more in addition to the marginal wood fern that you might consider if you can find this one that will be evergreen in your garden. Marsh fern, Thelipterus palustris is common throughout Virginia. It's native to a range of different elevations but prefers wetlands. This one has spreading erect to arching fronds about two to three feet tall. And this one can actually grow in sun to part shade as long as it has that moist soil. And this one has a low creeping rhizome, so it will be slowly spreading. New York fern, Paratholepterus noveborosensis, is another one common throughout Virginia. It grows in a wide range of habitats from low to high elevation. This one is quite fast spreading, so you'll see either single fronds or clusters. Now, various resources have listed this as growing one to two feet tall. Plant Nova Natives says up to six feet. This one grows in part to full shade and dry to wet soil, and it has fine textured fronds that are narrow both at the bottom near the stipe here all the way to the tip of the frond. This one reproduces very rapidly into dense colonies. Our final fern for today is bracken fern, Pteridium aquilinum. This one is common throughout Virginia. In fact, it's found in every state in the United States and on every continent except Antarctica. This one's native to a wide range of habitats from dry to wet, very fast spreading, the blades grow horizontally and the sterile and fertile fronds will be very similar, reaches one to four feet in height, providing cover and nesting materials. This one can also take uh, sunny conditions as well as part shade and dry to wet soil. Now, an alert, the roots of this particular fern colonize very aggressively. They can reach up to 10 feet deep and this one can even re-sprout easily after fire. I'm a little surprised that this one has been recommended for garden use because it has allelopathic properties. That means that it's going to exude chemicals that will make it difficult for other plants, especially desirable native plants to grow in your garden. And it's toxic both to humans and animals, especially horses. I'd like to move on to talk a little bit about care of ferns. As I've mentioned, most of these tend to prefer rich soil, but some can tolerate poor soil, and they tend to prefer the pH on the acidic end of the range from 4.0 to 7.0, which is neutral. Most of these prefer consistently moist soil, but note the tolerances that I've mentioned. 
you are going to want to provide good drainage for ferns, especially for the drought tolerant species. The first ones I mentioned were ebony spleenwort, marginal wood fern, Christmas fern, and then among the fast spreading ferns, hay scented fern. You want to do that to avoid the crown or root rot. And you may want to use that technique I mentioned of planting the rhizomes on a slight angle, especially if they're on a slope so that water is shed away from them. Spring is the time to propagate them if you would like to multiply the ferns in your garden. You'd want to transplant them if you've divided them as soon as new growth appears to prevent transplant shock. Now, another reason to divide your ferns would be if the fronds over time appear to be smaller or if like other perennials, they tend to develop dead areas in the center of the clump. Of course, in summertime, you may need to provide supplemental water if we're going through a very long drought period. And in fall, that would be the time to cut the deciduous species back to the crown after a killing frost. With Christmas fern, that's an evergreen fern. Marginal wood fern is evergreen, so you would keep those standing. And with the ferns that have the lingering fertile fronds, like ostrich fern, and sensitive fern, you would obviously want to keep those structures standing. Those will be very attractive for winter interest, and then they're going to release their spores in the spring. Here are a few more details about uh, dividing the ferns for multiplying them. For the clumping ferns, you want to dig up the entire plant and identify the crowns. Those are the circles of fronds around these growing points. You'll want to have a sterile sharp knife and cut between the crowns like so. And you want to make sure that each section is going to have a good root mass to reestablish. For the spreading ferns, you'll want to cut segments of rhizome with fronds attached as shown here. And then for all of these, you'll replant these new sections at the original depth and make sure to water them well until they're well established. When I've given talks about native plants uh, for the last couple of years, I've had many questions about how to grow native plants from seed. Of course, ferns do not grow from seed, they grow from spores. And we don't have time to go into detail about this today. But I did want to briefly mention a little bit of information about this, two really great sources. The first is Brooklyn Botanic Garden, and Julie will be uh, providing a link for you in the chat. This is a really great site. It has a very lengthy blog description. It explains sources of spores, which include the American Fern Society, if you're collecting them yourself from your own ferns, how to go about doing that, when to tell that the spores are mature, how to clean them. Then there's a recipe for a growing medium and a discussion of how to prepare the containers and details on the care and how to deal with any diseases or pests that might develop as you're going through that germination fertilization process. Another really great site is for the British Teratological Society. This one is good because it boils the steps down to very simple terms, very basic practical steps, and it has lots of really good photos to talk you through the whole process of growing ferns. So good luck to you if you want to follow those steps. And finally, for a bit of inspiration, I'm just including some photos uh, from the many gardens that I visited that show you how to landscape with ferns. Of course, the tall ferns are going to be wonderful dramatic accent plants. This is royal fern shown at Ledoux Topiary Gardens. Other great ferns that would be good would be interrupted fern, which can reach five to six feet, and ostrich fern, which is very showy, three to six feet in height and up to five to eight feet in width. If you have a smaller garden, of course, even the smaller, shorter ferns, like marginal wood fern, two to three feet high and wide, which has a really nice vase shape, could be quite a nice accent plant. You could also consider grouping ferns of several species as they've done here. This is the native plant garden in Potomac Overlook Park. 
also at that same location. Plumping ferns are ideal for edging. This might be Christmas fern here. And this one is a slow spreading fern, the maidenhair fern, which I mentioned was also really attractive along pathways. The slow spreading ferns, here I'm showing the maidenhair fern again, can be really attractive used underneath shrubbery as a kind of a green mulch. And of course, the fast spreading ferns are wonderful as a ground cover. This is quite a large stand of ostrich ferns at Winterthur in Pennsylvania. The large ferns are really attractive when combined with spring bulbs. This photo I took of visiting David Culp's garden up in Pennsylvania. He's a landscape designer who has published books on landscaping with plants. Ferns are also excellent for interplanting with spring ephemerals. Here I'm showing a big stand of May apple, Podophyllum peltatum. This is great in the spring, but this is all going to die back. And so the ferns that I've interspersed here, along with Allegheny Spurge and Solomon Seal, are going to linger on after the May apple has died back. Of course, you'll want to use moisture-loving ferns with different garden water features in rain gardens, beside ponds and streams, and next to waterfalls. And on the other extreme, use those drought-tolerant species in dry shade. And remember that some ferns can even grow between rocks. A few other tips, vase-shaped ferns are viewed best when they're seen in profile. This particular example is cinnamon fern. The other clumping ferns would be, for example, the marginal wood fern and Christmas fern. Another way to show them off would be to leave ample room between them when you plant them in a grouping. And a particular note, Christmas fern has especially dark foliage, very dark, and so you might want to set it off against a lighter background so it won't just blend into the background. You might also want to consider using ferns in containers. My good friend and Master Gardener colleague Alyssa Ford Morell took these photos up at Mount Cuba in Delaware, and they show how you can use a large fern such as the royal fern or ostrich fern as the so-called thriller component in a, a mixed combination of plants. Here, this is marginal wood fern kind of drooping over the edge used as a spiller plant in this combination, or you could just use them planted singly as shown here. And here are a few tips. If you are in our local Northern Virginia area, I invite you to visit our Master Gardener demonstration gardens where you'll see ferns. Of course, the optimal location would be our quarry shade garden, which has a great number of these ferns. And also on your handout, I provided a link to an excellent article by the coordinators of that garden, a whole discussion on shade ferns that are showcased there. We have quite a few ferns also at Glen Carlin Garden, the garden I helped to coordinate. And you'll see ostrich fern included at our organic vegetable garden because the fiddleheads, as I mentioned, are edible. Some local public gardens in the Washington DC area. Fern Valley has a wonderful collection at the US National Arboretum. Potomac Valley Trail at Meadowlark Botanical Gardens in Northern Virginia and the Azalea Garden at Brookside Gardens in Wheaton, Maryland. And then a little further afield, some wonderful regional public gardens. You see many ferns along this a nature walk, a boardwalk at Ladue Topiary Gardens. Another boardwalk, the Virginia Native Plant Garden at Norfolk Botanical Garden. The March Bank area at Winterthur and the Forest District at Longwood Gardens. Finally, a few tips on where to buy native plants. Here in Northern Virginia, I refer you to the Plant Nova Natives website. They will give you a list of native only sellers up here in Northern Virginia, but a little further afield. And they also seasonally will list all the local plant sales. If you find yourself in other areas of Virginia, I understood there were some folks, for example, visiting from Charlottesville. I urge you to visit the Virginia Native Plant Society's website. There you'll see a very extensive list of native plant nurseries with location 
and websites and phone information. For those of you visiting from Virginia, I refer you to the Maryland Native Plant Society website. Again, a great detailed list. And if you're visiting from other states, check your own uh, Native Plant Society. All right, any final questions, Colleen? Um, someone asked about a plot they have that is streamside and has both flooding and drought. Um, they wanted to know what they could plant there to compete with invasives. And I was wondering if your bracken fern would serve, but I didn't know if it can do both. Yeah, the bracken fern, I think, was one that really tolerated a, a wide range of conditions. And there were several others that I mentioned that while they preferred those moist locations could actually tolerate dry or some that uh, took the dry that could withstand the flooding. For example, the cinnamon fern was one that could right. actually grow in standing water. One final question. Someone has a rocky plot. They want to know how to plant in a rocky area. Specifically, do you have to augment with soil? Well, the ebony spleenwort is one that can really grow in very thin soil, but I guess you may want to add a little bit of organic material, you know, some soil and enrich it with compost as you're planting the ferns. I'm assuming that those individuals would be planting maybe very young rhizomes rather than trying to encourage the growth from the spores, and so you'd want to provide a little bit of material to tuck in between. Okay. Well, that actually wraps up the questions and thank you. You're welcome. I wanted to mention that for those of you who are excited about ferns as something that's especially an attractive category of plants for shade, next month I will be giving a talk specifically on native plants for shade gardens. And I'll go on to describe the many other plants from trees and shrubs, other herbaceous plants, and mentioning the ferns again that will be ideal for those kinds of growing conditions. So I hope I'll see a number of you again next month. Okay, thanks a lot, Elaine. You're welcome and happy gardening to all of you.